Well, discover the secret to financial freedom as Paula White Kane joins us to transform how we think about wealth and reveals how to make your money work for you. Well, if you're enjoying Table Talk, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Remember to click that notification bell to stay up to date on all of our latest posts. Well, we all know that wealth can have a significant impact on our lives, but according to today's guest, how you think about money might actually be what's keeping you from unlocking its true potential. So you're going to want to stay tuned to hear more about that. But first, join me around the table is my daughter in love, Susanna Lamb. How are you? Amazing. I'm yeah. so happy to be here. I know. You know, I've got all three of my girls at the table today. <laughs> yes. To Haviland Ford, how are you? I am so excited, and I just am excited for our next guest because I know yes. the economy. We need to know how to how to survive yeah. in these days. And if I ever go to Jamaica, can I borrow you? Yeah. That yeah. I, I will purchase it for you. Back to Jamaica. All right, um. Rachel M. Brown, my first daughter. How are you? I'm good, and I think that this subject's important to learn, to yeah. know, to be better. You know, we need to steward everything that the Lord has given us. Yeah. Uh, well, and that's a lesson that Dad really taught us, and in, in you as well. But this is something all of our viewers need to learn about. It's really, really important. And uh, Rebecca Lamweiss, my second uh, daughter, this is um, information, practical information that we need to know and understand. I mean, even as women that sit around the table. Oh, money's really important. I mean, you can ask any person, they'll admit to that. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be wise yeah. about how we handle our money, and we cannot allow money to rule our lives. We right. have to become free of that pressure and that burden and not live by the love of money, but that doesn't mean we can't be good stewards of our money. That's right. Cindy Murdoch, how are you? I'm doing good. And I'm, I'm thinking about this, that it's so sad that in our schools, this is not a priority no. to be taught. Yeah, yeah, so true. Yeah. Well, she is a renowned speaker, minister, and author, and she's here to share some of the principles revealed in her book, Money Matters, Please welcome my dear friend, Paula White Kane is in the house. Yay! <laughs> Look at this, what I get All to right. be with today. The most beautiful, <laughs> like smart, part of the, women. part of the family here. Yeah, I love this. Honest. I feel it. Yeah, I Good. love it. Love you guys. So think about this. Could the way you think about money be affecting your ability to multiply it? And how do we build generational wealth and not simply just get out of debt? Well, Paula takes on these important questions in her book, Money Matters, and she's here to share some of the insights she's learned from her own journey. Let's go back, because people look at you today and they're like, oh my goodness, she is just so together on everything. And the girl can preach, let me just tell you, oh, she yes. can preach. But um, it wasn't always that way. I was gonna say, Let's the makeup's go making it look real good then right now. <laughs> yeah, it, my life has been really uh, oppositions and since like I was born into a pretty well-to-do family. My father committed suicide and our wealth was immediately lost. Oh. We were living in a tiny apartment, two outfits. Um, I remember a fight with my brother over half a bowl of spaghetti. My mother remarried when I was nine. She, very educated, two, you know, two master's doctorate. Um, but a raging alcoholic. And so it, it, there was all these different things. To get saved when I'm 18, my parents didn't like, they thought I became a Jesus freak. So they, they thought I was messing up my life, you know, which was a great mess up. Everybody was on board. Everybody eventually got <laughs> saved. But I say that because they didn't like my decision. So they said, we're going to cut you off. I thought, they'll never wow. cut me off. Wow. Now, that cutting off then was like middle class. It wasn't wealth, wealth. Yeah. But I was like, they'll take care of my school and stuff. They cut me off. I mean, like literally yeah. nothing. And it was oh, wow. actually one of the best things for me. Crazy, so I find myself pregnant and I'm living in a trailer. So people say, you're trailer trash. I go, but God's in the recycling business. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned something. I started a company in that trailer. I was like, I've got to do something. And I had a few acres. I started gardening and making canned goods and oh, wow. sending them down to the market. And I learned how, I learned ROI, people's like that, return on investment, <laughs> yeah. um, what I needed to do. Then I learned how to get people to sell it for me. <laughs> so I learned how to mass produce yeah. with my garden. So it really started in there. And I had a choice, Joni. I could either go in an apartment at that time, um, or I could have gotten that trailer, it was like $37,000. Mm -hmm. And well, it a few, had acreage. It had acreage. A few years later, I'd sell it for $96,000. 
$10,000 and begin. So at 18 years old, so people go, why'd you write this book? Because everything we're facing, and I think as a business person who's a Christian, as a pastor who sees how finances destroy people's life, I've written so much on the spiritual side, what the Bible has to say, right. and that's all in here. But this is very much a psychological, a practical, a money, a real map and guideline and yeah. those tough questions. So I've had loss, I've gone through a divorce, I've uh, had times and, and I've had lots of gain and I've made some dumb decisions, lots, you know, and I've made some really smart decisions. So I take all that and the mentors, God has put incredible people in my life. Mm -hmm. One year, six billionaires came into my life. Yeah. None of them, not one of them, God told me specifically with one, don't ever take a dime from. And none of them ever gave to me as far as any finances or anything, mm -hmm. but they gave to me. Mm -hmm. They allowed me Wisdom. access. Yes. Wisdom. And yes. I thought they That's think amazing. different than I do. Mm -hmm. Oh, they they make different decisions than I do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just, just thinking about this generation and how there's such a lack of teaching on finances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're just such a consumerism and just yeah. spending, spending. How would you speak to just this generation on how to be better stewards in, in, in terms of finances? Well, we, most people don't think about it till it's too late. Mm -hmm. So I want them to just first off think when they're getting ready to go to college or into trade or go to work, mm -hmm. first thing that's shoved to them in the mail or at an airport or on a campus is a credit card, right? Yes. A little bit of debt's not a bad thing. I'm not a totally, like, no debt. But before you know it, you get out of school, you've got 30, 50, 100,000 yeah. plus student loans. Yeah. You look insane. at that, it's crazy. You yeah. go put a, a, a dress on there that's $500, $120, whatever's fitting your fancy for that month, right? Well, by the time you pay that off on the payments that you can afford to make, you've paid over, mm -hmm. say, $5,000 for a $500 purchase. And, and it'll actually be a lot more than that with today's compounded interest. Yes. If you take that same money as we know, and you were to invest it or do something within yourself or something that's producing generational wealth, and we go, what is that? Let's just start thinking about building beyond our consumer self. We, we recognize um, by the time you're 65, which Social Security probably won't be around, <laughs> yeah, right. uh, you're going to be okay, and you really will. Right. So, but what's the problem? If we all know that, why aren't we doing it? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly. the bigger question. Because I can teach practical stuff all day. We all know what it takes with this kind of information, how to be healthy, but not everybody's healthy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we know it, why aren't we doing it? That's what I dive into and I make us confront ourselves, and I get deep into that iceberg syndrome of what is your first thought about mm -hmm. money. People don't think feelings are attached to money so much, right. but they are. So are biases, how we think about rich people, how we think about poor people, mm -hmm. how we see the world, what opportunity comes to us, um, what we speak about money. I mean, immediate, we can't afford that. Instead of saying we can't afford that at that checkout line, and, and t oftentimes, technically, the money's not there to purchase that, go, how do we afford this? Yes. Like, open up just by mm -hmm. changing the thinking. So we really get in and deal with the icebergs because I say the commas and zeros in your bank account start in your mind. Mm -hmm. What are some of the biggest psychological roadblocks that you see that are preventing people from living financially free? Rachel, it's the same as trauma in a childhood or abuse. And you go, you're kidding me. There was something, our biggest personality is formed, but 85% of our personality, of course, is formed by the time we're six years old. Wow. So as a child, they say the biggest way to teach money management is let children like watch you pay your bills. Mm -hmm. And most parents either hide it, don't talk about it, they fight about it, etc. So Whatever your first memory. So if we went around here and said, what's your first memory of money? Every one of us, people will be shocked what it is. Mine was money has wings. So to me, you might have money, but it's going to be gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Something's going to take it. Mm -hmm. So what does that produce? Either real frugalness, which I can, you know, make yeah. Lincoln cry, or it produces a uh, same thing with love. If you don't believe someone's really going to love you and be there during the good and the bad, what do you do? I want it, I want it, but really don't get too close to me. Mm -hmm. So you tend to have some of the same tendencies. Mm -hmm. Come, I want you, get money, but what do you do? Push it out. And you become your own worst enemy. Mm -hmm. Job says, the thing that I feared the mm -hmm. most has come upon me. So when you think money, what emotion do you think? Joy, anger, disappointment, fear, 
You start identifying, and just the way we walk through so many things in our life, you'll find that you have a very deep psychological relationship with money. How should we view it? What is the appropriate psychological response? I don't think any of us are gonna fit that same pattern. Yeah. We should be the healthiest, I think, Joni, that we could be. Yeah. So for someone who is like, fearful where it's paralyzing, mm -hmm. you know, but some kind of fear is good that you just don't go out and mm -hmm. you're blindly put a risk with that. So if right. I said, well, you shouldn't have fear, you need a little bit of fear, right? right? Mm -hmm. So that you're not reckless with it, but we don't want that uh, paralyzation of fear, what we'd call terror. Yeah. So it's like, I think you look at, you know, our nine primary emotions, they'd say six, but if you expand that to the nine, and I list them right here, you know, everything's like right there in the book, the questions to ask yourself, the pathway to get the answer. So this book is a real confrontational and it's gonna like make that. you just like really answer. That's why I did the workbook yeah. with it to go here, you're gonna discover things. And that's why so often, who does this before two people get married? Right. Yeah. So if you go mm -hmm. into what his earliest memory, what his embedded iceberg, when I say iceberg syndrome, it's the thoughts that are beneath the subconscious that are actually driving us every yeah. single day that are, you, you don't see on the surface. And then what his are, what ours yeah. are, boy. And then you combine those, it can wow. be combustion. That's good. Well, let's, let's just go around the table. Susie, what would be the word that would describe your view of money? Giving offerings was my exciting big thing. So I've always viewed money from that lens, but obviously that the the bottom line of that is purpose. You know, what can I do to please my father? So how so would you, you would attach say purpose? So would purpose. you say purpose? Let me yeah. ask everybody that, and then we'll come back to okay. that question to Haviland. Interesting. I'd say fear. Yeah, so you can relate to what she's saying. Yeah. We'll get you the book. Yeah. No, sure. <laughs> yeah. So Rachel. Okay, so I would think like frugal, and then also like generous as well. Right. So. Yeah, I would I would say from my earliest memory, I I grew up middle class, but we were blessed and. So my, both my parents work hard, but for me, money is like a tool. Mm. Like I view it as a tool and also it mm. should for, be like a, a, a free flowing stream. In other yeah. words, it comes in, it should go back out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, and so giving is a huge part yeah. of, um, <laughs> of what money is yeah. to me. Rebecca, what would you say? I would say the word that comes to my mind is like bountiful. Like there was never like a worry about it. And yeah. so you having like a peace. Yeah, Cindy? I think pleasure in the sense that it brought joy to be able to give and do and bless and I just, yeah. it was. Okay, so that's interesting. I mean, you maybe ask yourself that question. You had one. Okay, so if you put purpose to money, I feel like then your whole worldview changes with how you deal with money. Can you well, speak on that? You, you've just hit the core of what this book is about. Oh, And what's jackpot. interesting to me <laughs> is, <laughs> sincerely, I'm also talking to women who are pretty really healthy. I'm just being honest. Mm, yeah. You guys are, you, you came from good godly families. You had good role models as parents. Yeah. You didn't, you, you, you are the mentor that most of us would yeah. hope for. The de Havilland. And to, that's to, not really your story. Uh, I'm, no, but yeah. the rest. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. I'm yeah. saying that, that the, I'm saying the lamb, the lamb girls, right, yeah. for a minute, yeah. and Cindy here, because I say money without a mission is materialism. Yeah. And you think where we are in the go. world today. Yeah. Mm. So the biggest problem, like you just saw the New York Times, all, all this come out, patriotism way down, religion way down, mm -hmm. the desire, what's the only thing that's a tick up in America? Materialism. Mm. And USA Today years ago did the thing that they took the, crux of like American problems was materialism. Mm -hmm. So you you don't see money as materialism, you see it as generosity mm -hmm. for the kingdom. Right. If everyone had that viewpoint, I'm telling you, money would be a healthy thing. People would live in places they could afford, right. they would understand God is a good father, they'd understand the ethics of working, but we know just by stats out there, in church, out of church, that's not our reality. That's true. Yeah, that's so true. So you were hitting on this earlier and you just kind of brought it up right there with generational wealth. What is that and how can people work towards that? So a lot of times you start hearing this word a lot now. And the, the number one way I'll say, I'll take the end and then go to the back, the beginning to build generational wealth is through home ownership, passing down homes. So that, that's the number one way. But generational wealth is where you're not starting upside down really, and you're thinking beyond yourself. So it, when I was living in a trailer, was I able to think generational wealth? Naturally, no, I was in survival mode, yeah. trying to get off government cheese and da da. You're just trying to, most people, I know a lot of people, and most people are living paycheck to paycheck. 
Most people in our churches, most people have that anxiety. What if something happens, this inflation? That's the reality. For, and that paycheck could still be a $60,000, $80,000. But when you change this, what changed me? I read J.C. Penney's story. Mm -hmm. So J.C. Penney was a hot dog vendor that was a Christian, and he wanted to give 90% to God and live off 10%. Wow. And he ended up doing it. Wow. So I said to myself, if he could start as a hot dog vendor, because I read somewhere, you know, Acts, that God is no respecter of persons. Hebrews 13, 8, he's the same today, yesterday, forevermore. And I was so young and innocent in the word, I just believed it. Yeah. So I was like, God, if you did it for JC, you're going to do it for me. Yeah, I love <laughs> yeah, exactly. it. And I, I took on that. And so I said, well, how can I do that? Well, it hit me. He gave 90%. So I started something very practical. My budget was only a few thousand then, you know, but I lived off percentages. So my percentage for my mortgage, which was $371, might have been, you know, they'd say don't do more than 28%. Might have been 18%. I was like, how do I get this down that my life fits in within 10%? Mm. Or how does, you know, the money increase? And so then you start doing other right. things, business opportunities, five streams of income. What do you do? What do you value? Because everyone's got the same thing, mm -hmm. 24 hours, seven days. Exactly. So what can money not take you away from? And you have to answer that. For me, when Brad, the first five years, it was so important that I was with him. I'd rather live in a trailer with him, putting everything into him, than a mansion having to go work and be gone all the time. Right. Yeah. So it, it, your values fit into this too, that you really have to say, where does that fit? And then fighting the whole culture, right. fighting the you know definition of we are, who we are by what we wear, by what we you know drive, by where we live. That's just a lie. Yeah. How do you deal with this mindset where it's like, if your family didn't leave generational wealth, you're then cr you're crippled or you believe you have to like look to the government or like breaking that cycle of I'm getting a, a kind of like you're not getting that start that everyone else is getting. Absolutely. Like, how do you address that mindset? Because I know I'm breaking that in my family and I'm the one bringing in and shifting it. But I hear a lot of that talk. But we didn't get that same it's, start. It's the biggest talk I hear. I do an entire chapter on this called That's personal so good. responsibility. So yeah. good. And I do it from a biblical and a psychological going you know, be grateful for anything that has been given to us. I, I think people should travel the world. 75% live on a dollar a day. That changes an American perspective immediately. Um, where people live, I mean, our worst places have cable and running water. You know, that's not most of the world. Yeah. So when we begin to understand, because if not, that's where we get into unforgiveness, bitterness, hatred. That's, that's where we get into rebellion. We don't like other ethnicities. We think that life's unfair. Right, right. and that is like, who told you that? Is right. That's yeah. the yeah. early memories. Because mm -hmm. when you go to India oh. and you see what we saw, Oof. you realize how blessed people are here, even those that just live in, in an apartment. A, exactly. a trailer. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. With, but that's a change of perception. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what we really, we, I want to break those boulders off because you'll find, I mean, I have, I know people that they're in church, but there's, there's roots of bitterness because this person has money. Mm -hmm. You know, someone said something to me, I, is right when we were starting to break through just extreme poverty, right? And I started to travel and started to do things. We're running um, companies and I had a strong intercessor. And people say, oh, that's terrible she said this. I thought it was great. Her name was Kathy. And she would help me a couple days a week. And she'd come over and help me get, you know, I'd pay her to help me organize and clean and do what needed to be done when I was, you know, starting to get all over. And she goes, I can't do this anymore. And I said, why not? And I, when she goes, I can't live in poverty and work, and work in prosperity. Now, it, prosperity was for us at the time, you know, 1,200 foot square house, but it was big to her. And I said, she goes, I don't want to end up hating you. I appreciated her doing that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate her. I prayed with her. We worked through it and I started teaching her. Mm -hmm. And today she's a proud home ownership. She's raised successful That's children. Awesome. She broke that off of her life. Yes, but the yes. same word that started breaking those mindsets in me I'm like, I was grateful she came to that yeah. because yeah. hiddenly she could have just had that resentment. Right. That's like, so oh, true. it worked for you. Think about how many people come against what they call the prosperity. And I deal with all that. I talk about what is provision, what is prosperity, mm. what does that actually mean, secular terms, biblical terms. 
And what they're saying, because none of us believe God's a Santa Claus. Right. None yeah. of us believe you give the get. Yeah. Right. You know, none of us believe like there's this lotto machine. Yeah. We w- work out of generosity. You know, we walk out of, I want to be generous. I want to do more in the earth to advance the kingdom of yeah. God. But there are mindsets that resist people like myself that believe in ger- generosity because they believe I'm just one of the lucky ones. Yeah. I'm one of the ones that somehow got in God's sovereignty and got blessed. Mm-hmm. Well, wow. Not at all. I'm going to deconstruct all that yeah. in here. Yeah. So good. What so, about, there's, there's two traits you say that are so very vital for success mm-hmm. and how they affect us. Can you talk about those? Um, I talk a lot about that in personal re- responsibility. Number okay. one, how we think and our words. Mm-hmm. It's just like anything. You can speak against yourself at all times because your actions are simply mm-hmm. out of, you know, our thoughts become our beliefs, yeah. our beliefs become our actions. Yeah. So what we do or don't do, success is really first in your spirit. Mm-hmm. You've got to get God's perspective for your life. Yeah. And what does God say? And there are people that really believe God's going to send you right to hell if you have money. (laughs) And there are other people that just believe, like, God wants you to have everything. Success is highly individualized, just like a mantle, just like a calling. And, you know, um, I was just sitting here thinking that we we really have to touch on this, too, because I think it's such an important part of understanding about money is that, you know, as God blesses us, when we give back Mm -hmm. to the kingdom of God... Like, nobody wants to talk about that. Oh, don't talk. You want my money? No. But there is a direct blessing. Yes. Absolutely. When we give, when we tithe. I mean, that was one of the first things that my dad taught me was tithing Amen. the 10%. If I had $10, I would give a dollar. And I learned that, and it has served me well through my whole life, yeah. even in, in the small times. We've all had small times. I remember when we first got married, and we were trying to build the first Christian television station in the history of the state of Alabama there in Montgomery, and I, he said, I want you to do the checkbook because you need to see exactly how much money we have and we don't have. We always paid our tithes, but we would get down to like $26.32 <laughs> and I balanced it right to the penny. Mm. And, um, but you say, well, look at you now. Yeah, look at me now because I was faithful with the small. Absolutely. And it, it starts there, doesn't it's it? It's the stewardship. It's the small yes. journey. That, so again, the premise of this book is money without a mission is materialism. Yes. So what is money with a mission? Generosity. Yeah. It's getting outside yourself. Helping the poor. It's yes. exactly. All the things Supporting that the we want to do. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's crazy. The critique, you know, it, my biggest challenge with the critiques are usually this. Like, oh, all you do is talk about that. Well, the people who are critiquing are making money off critiquing. Mm, I mean, they're, they're selling books that they're writing against you, making a million dollars. No, and dollars. the people that are, it's p- crazy. that are critiquing don't give any money That's to what I mean. anyone. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying, but they're <laughs> making a million victims. dollars critiquing you. Or right. I'm just yeah. using yeah. an exaggerated yeah, number. This is about, you will have to, co- I will make you face that in this book, that you're going to have to really look inside and, and do that heart test. And, and figure it out. Like, you're going to find out, do I really operate out of generosity? Yeah. That comes yeah. to with our kids. That comes to how we handle things. Our church, God, yeah. ministry. That comes to down when you walk down the street and pass someone. Yeah. But you believe that everything you have belongs to God. 100%. Yeah. When, and see, and that's another part of the stewardship. Right. We're just stewarding what he's yeah, blessed us with. And, you know, one of the things that you said is, like, money is a tool. And that's something that my dad taught me early on. Because when you all first started in Alabama, he had someone that wrote in and was like, you should just sell everything and give everything to the poor. And he taught me, he's like, I could have done that. And that would have been a good thing. But was that a God thing? Because I took what the Lord had given me. I yeah. stewarded it well. And now yeah. he's yeah. given over a hundred million dollars away. Exactly. So yeah. this would have been the end. Yes. So, but the person criticizing, you should sell everything you have and give to the poor. Of course. Well, then it would have been the end. Yeah. They said that to Jesus too. Yeah. And they came in annoyed. So it's like, here's yeah. what's so important yeah. with that. And also, Paula, they, they misquote the scripture that says, they, they say, well, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. Yeah. No, <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't say that. <laughs> it says the love no. of money. Is the root of all kinds of evil. Yes. That's yeah. right. That's yes. right. But it, 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 which is really deep there. You're right. <laughs> so it's interesting because, again, we go back to mindsets. Yeah. So 
if money, which it says the love of money is the root of all evil, why are you obsessing over it all the time? You know, why exactly. are you thinking about it? So again, we have to get back into what is that in here? Mm -hmm. You know, that is that, and the only way to really heal this is Romans 12, one and two, that I've got to be born again yes. and be not conformed to this world, the ages, the times, the culture, but be transformed mm -hmm. in the renewing of my mind by the word of God. That word is what changes us in every area. For some reason, people, the Bible, the Bible has a lot to say about taboo topics that people don't want to get into. They don't want to talk about money. I've hit it head on. Don't want to talk about sex. It's all in there. They don't want to talk about the things that we're dealing with in culture. The Bible yes. is literally full of every answer. It really we need. is. It really is. And I, you know, as we're, we're talking about this, I know, I feel like some of it's clicking with you and you're like, well, I've never really thought about it that way. And, uh, but you know, I would be remiss if I didn't say to you today, really, I don't think you can have a total, complete understanding of all of this unless you have a personal relationship mm -hmm. with God. And so would you just take a moment, if you would, Paula, and just give people an opportunity to pray and invite the Lord into their life so they can have a greater understanding and the blinders can come off concerning some of these truths. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe right now uh, you're, you tuned in because you're like, this is good, I need, I need money, it does matter. But really what you need is a relationship with Jesus Christ because he's the one that brings you to God the Father who God will give you wisdom. God will guide you. God will lead you. God will break those generational curses off you. You say, how do I get this? The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that he's the Son of God, Jesus Christ came to this earth as God incarnate, crucified on an old rugged cross, buried in a borrowed tomb, but got up on the third day. That resurrection life, that resurrection power, and the covenant that he gave you gives you everything you need pertaining to this life. And if you'll receive Jesus, you can have an intimate relationship with him, with the Father, and with the Holy Spirit. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Father, I come I to you, you in the name, name of Jesus. Jesus. Forgive me. Forgive me. For all my sins. For all my sins. I receive. I receive Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ as Lord, as Lord and, Savior. and Savior. Right now, right. whether you felt something great or whether it was just, okay, I said that, call that number right now. I want you to call the prayer line. I want you to get in touch with us here because that's the first step. It's what we call born again. And that, that you know, saved comes from this word sozo. Mm -hmm. And it means to be rescued, to be delivered, to be made whole, to be restored. And boy, God is our provider. He's yes. the ultimate provider of our yes. life. And yes. you find that out. Um, we do our part, God does his part. But the greatest provision we ever have is relationship with him. Yes, yes. so important, so good. And we are out of time. <laughs> but I want you to remember that God pours out blessings on our lives every day. The question is, how will we steward them? And of course, praying that prayer, you allow God into your life to do some supernatural things that have never been done before. And of course, when you honor God with what he puts in your hands, he will multiply that as well. If you're watching today and you want God to give you wisdom regarding how you steward your finances, or maybe you prayed that prayer with Paula, that's why that toll-free number is on the screen. We have amazing prayer partners that are standing by ready to pray and encourage you today. I do want to thank Paula for joining us at the table. Be sure to check out her book, Money Matters. A lot of practical information that can help you. And of course, you can find out more by visiting her online at paulawhite.org. And let us know your thoughts about today's talk. Leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. Hey, I'm excited about what God is going to do for you in the days to come. And yes, he has anointed you for such a time as this. And as you has, have invited him into your heart and life, I just believe there are gonna be supernatural doors that are gonna open. And um, God is going to take what he's put in your hand and use it in a mighty way for the kingdom of God. And what you're gonna do is gonna be connected to eternity. You've been, you've been thinking about it, wondering if God had something for you to do, he does. So don't miss that. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye for today.